Uh, I'm Ron Pren, a uh, member of the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences, and I direct MIT's Center for Global Change Science. It's my great pleasure today to introduce our special lecturer, uh, Professor Kerry Emanuel. I must admit that I cannot think of a better person in the world to address this topic of uh, hurricanes that he's going to address. Uh, Kerry is the uh, Cecil and Ida Green Professor of uh, Atmospheric Science here in the department, and he also co-directs uh, the Lorenz Center. Uh, the department and the Lorenz Center are the co-sponsors of, uh, of this special lecture today. Uh, Kerry got his PhD in 1978 from MIT and uh, then joined the faculty in 1981 at MIT. He's been here a long time. <laughs> Not quite as long as me, but uh, getting there. Uh, Kerry is a world-renowned uh, expert in the physics of uh, moist convection and uh, tropical cyclones. Uh, he's uh, beautifully uh, equipped to address the topic that he will address today. What do Hurricanes Harvey and Irma portend? All I'll add to that, as I hope Kerry explains, the fall of the four hurricanes that have followed those two, and what I'm thinking must be going to be called the 2017 hurricane train. So, <laughs> Kerry, please enlighten us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think you put that down. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that, uh, of the tragic irony of presenting to you this lecture a few hours after another Hurricane Maria has evidently completely devastated the island, <coughs> excuse me, of Puerto Rico. So I hope that uh, if you have friends and family there that they're all safe. Now in the wake of great natural disasters and tragedies, uh, such as the hurricanes we've experienced this fall, um, it's natural to ask uh, if these are just normal events, they're unusual. Uh, people in my profession get bombarded uh, by the media and over-eager over journalists who want to attribute it to something, these days climate change. On the other side, we have folks like the head of the Environmental Protection Agency who thinks that this is not a good time to talk about climate change, which makes me wonder whether had he been around on 9-11, he would have told New Yorkers, this is not a good time to talk about terrorism. Well, I take issue with that. It is a very good time to talk about that. But we're MIT, and we want to, and we should, approach this rationally. And I'm here today to try to tell you how my profession deals with the whole question of hurricanes and climate change. So the program, broadly, is to begin talking about just the global hurricane hazard what is it, uh, how, how bad is it, uh, <clears throat> to talk about inferences that we might make about hurricanes and climate from the uh, historical and, more recently, the geological records, um, inferences from basic physics. And then uh, I'd like to spend a little while telling you about something quite new, which is how we bring physics into the estimation of natural hazard risk. And I want to uh, end the uh, talk today by talking about MIT's flood risk, because it turns out that the risk to this campus is rather substantial. And this is ongoing work, so you'll hear at the very beginning of it. So let's begin with the globe. There are um, roughly, let's see if I've got this, about 10,000 deaths per year on average since 1971 globally. $700 billion in damages. And the truly shocking statistic is that the global population exposed to hurricane hazards has tripled since 1970. Now, before I go on with the physics of hurricanes and the nature of hurricane risk, let me say that the, the big problem isn't really a problem with a natural phenomenon. In fact, that whole phrase, natural phenomena, is a bit of a ruse that we hide behind to pretend that it is, in fact, natural and it's not us. But of course, earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanoes, what have you, are part of nature. Nature long ago adjusted to them. 
Um, what we're really talking about is unnatural disasters, disasters we cause by moving to and building inadequate structures in dangerous places. In the United States, we have some very, very unwise policies in place that actively subsidize people to live in and build in uh, dangerous places. And what is really going on is that people who are living in relatively risk-free places are actively subsidizing people who choose to live in dangerous places. And because we have those policies, we're going to have Harveys and Irmas and Sandys and Katrinas as far as the eye can see whether climate change affects these phenomena or not. So that is the 6,000 pound gorilla in this problem and we should bear that in mind as we continue to talk about the natural part of the hazard. So what are uh, the risks? When you hear the word hurricane, you naturally think of a big windstorm and of course that is a very big windstorm. Um, but in fact, it's other hazards involving water that in practice most of the time do most of the damage and are responsible for most of the loss of life. Uh, rain, uh, the flooding in Harvey is fresh in our minds. I don't need to review that with you. And the storm surge, uh, which was a big deal in hurricanes Katrina and uh, Sandy. Now, a lot of people really don't know what a storm surge is. They kind of know what the phrase means. It is hydrodynamically the same thing as a tsunami. All right? It's just that it's been excited by wind rather than by shaking seafloor. And I thought I'd show you an amateur clip, a rather horrible one, of the storm surge that accompanied Typhoon Hai, uh, Haiyan in the Philippines a little while ago. So if I can get this to go. And I think you can see that you can't survive something like that. In fact, the fellow who took this video was lucky to get away with his own life. The place he was in happened not to collapse. Uh, I wish everybody who lived in the coastal region that's subject to hurricanes could see films like this, because this is not something you can walk away from. And it's reflected in statistics. So if we look just at the United States, at the reasons that people lose their lives in hurricanes, you see on this graph, which goes from 1970 to 1999, that most people who lose their lives drown in fresh water from rain. Um, so the storm surge, the salt water drowning is the second leading cause. And wind is really down there at, at three, and then there are other miscellaneous things as well. But water is the big killer, and yet, the Weather Channel doesn't usually send its reporters out to stand in a foot of water. They prefer to stand in the drama of a windstorm. So we keep thinking of them as windstorms. Now, there's another problem around the world, but particularly in the United States, is that if you have property insurance in a hurricane-prone region, um, your, your damage from fresh or salt water is not covered by private insurance. It's covered by the federal flood insurance program which, as you know, is pretty much bankrupt. Uh, it's publicly insured, and therefore the insurance industry has got no incentive to put any money into understanding quantitatively this risk any better. So no money is going into that risk to a first approximation, whereas the smaller risks of wind uh, have been researched a lot, uh, again, motivated by the private property insurance industry. So all the money is going to places which is down the list in, in terms of damage and loss of life. Okay, with that as a backdrop, I want to turn to the real subject of today's lecture, which is what can we learn about the relationship between climate change and hurricanes? Well, the first thing we might turn to are the historical records. Uh, but these are, it turns out, rather poor for the purpose. So let me just give you a little history of, of these records. Before about 1943, everything we know about hurricanes on the planet, save what we have found out recently from geology, which I'll get to in a minute, comes most, mostly from what I'll call anecdotal accounts. These are newspapers from coastal cities, uh, reports from ships and so forth. It's helter-skelter, it's not quantitative, it's hit and miss. 
Beginning in 1943, we started to systematically survey hurricanes in the North Atlantic and also in the western part of the North Pacific with aircraft reconnaissance. Now, to send an airplane out, you had to know or suspect at least that there was a storm out there. So even in this era, you miss certain storms uh, just from using aircraft. Now, interestingly enough, before 1958, it was uh, literally impossible to measure wind speeds from an airplane because you didn't know how fast the airplane was moving with respect to the ground. You only knew its airspeed, its relative speed. In 1958, uh, inertial navigation, which was invented here at MIT, was finally implemented on these uh, reconnaissance flights. And so we had direct measurements of flight level winds. Uh, by 1970, more or less, we had complete global coverage of, uh, by satellites. And since about 1970, maybe a little bit later, it's unlikely that we actually missed any important storm on the planet. But satellites, although they take pretty pictures, aren't so good at actually providing quantitative measurements of the storms. In 1978, uh, we flew for the first time something called a scatterometer, which is a radar that sends a pulse of radiation about a few centimeters wavelength down to the sea surface. It backscatters from capillary waves, and by looking at it two different times in two different directions, you can get an idea of the amplitude and orientation of the little capillary waves. And from that, you can make a direct estimate of wind stress. So one of the first really quantitative measurements that's useful for hurricanes. Um, we stopped flying hurricanes in the Pacific for budgetary reasons in 1987, and today the only place we do that is the North Atlantic. So in some sense, we've taken a few steps backwards. Just this year, and I'll show you some very early results that I don't think anybody else has seen, we've started to fly a very nice uh, instrument on a new instrument on a satellite, and I'll say more about that in a minute. So to give you a feeling for the fact that even in the Atlantic, where we have fairly dense shipping and the much, much uh, greater historical depth of the record, um, we probably missed a lot of storms prior to 1970. So what this graph shows, and it's taken directly from the historical so-called best track hurricane database, is a number of major hurricanes from 1851 to the present, more or less, not including this year. But there are two, there's a, a subset here. Uh, there are two different subsets of the data. So the blue curve shows hurricanes that either pass through the Lesser Antilles, which were populated during this whole region, uh, whole time, I should say, or made landfall in the US. So those were very likely to have been recorded in historical records. The red uh, curve shows everything else, storms that didn't do that, the rest of the storms, most of which were out over the open ocean, and only some of which were sampled. And the two uh, straight lines there show just linear trends in those. And you can see that they're quite different. They both show an increase. The landfalling major hurricanes show a statistically significant increase over this period. But the uh, ocean storms increased well more than three times that rate. Now, did they really? Probably not. I mean, there's always a possibility that the ocean storms have behaved differently over this period. But a more likely explanation is that in the early part of the record, we just missed them. We just didn't happen to have a ship or an account there. And this is in the Atlantic, which is the best surveyed part of the ocean. So understanding what's happened uh, to hurricanes from the historical record is highly problematic. Now, there, people have done some clever things, I, like this paper, looking at the incidence of, of Spanish shipwrecks. Of course, the Spanish originally explored the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and so forth. And particularly, if you look at the second graph down, you can see the time scale at the very bottom there runs from uh, literally from 1000 AD to more or less the present, but that period in the middle there is a period of extensive Spanish shipping. Uh, you can see that there was a um, uh, very low percentage of Spanish shipwrecks in that period that's marked by the gray bar there, okay? Now, if you skip down to the fourth graph, that is a reconstruction of uh, solar radiation 
um, based upon an observed correlation between that and solar magnetic activity, and solar magnetic activity actually has a geological proxy, believe it or not. And so that gray bar marks a time known as the Maunder minimum, when, for example, there were essentially no sunspots observed. Um, and there seems to be a correspondence there. So we can start to make some inferences. They're a little bit tentative. But the historical record is really not very good for looking at climate signals. Now, in the satellite era, we can do much better, but we have limitations there, and it only goes back quantitatively in a good sense until 1980 or so. One trend that's unmistakable that you see on this chart which extends from 1980 to about uh, the present, is that it, showing, it shows the latitude at which hurricanes are observed to reach their peak intensity, regardless of what that intensity was. The upper graph is for the northern hemisphere, showing the positive distance away from the equator. And the lower graph is for the southern hemisphere, showing the negative distance away from the equator. In both hemispheres, storms are progressively reaching their peaks further and further away from the equator, that is closer to the poles. And that's something that was predicted theoretically, and it's one of the few trends that we see with some confidence. Now, as we go forward, things ought to get better because observing systems get better. I mentioned the sea surface scatterometer. Here's a really nice example of a hurricane that's been surveyed with a scatterometer. This is actually in the western North Pacific. You can see Taiwan over on the left of this diagram. And the, um, for the meteorologists in the audience, you'll be familiar with the notation of the wind barbs, which show the direction and speed. Uh, but the speed has also been color coded here according to the scale at the top. Um, and so we get a nice representation of surface winds, except that scatterometers really cannot see through heavy rain because their wavelength is very susceptible to absorption uh, and reflection by raindrops. So precisely where you need it in the heavy rain region in the core of the hurricane, you don't really see it. Now, this is something that very few people have seen. This is new. Um, this is an instrument that's just started to be, uh, or just went up this last spring. It's called Cygnus. And um, it's very clever. It's passive. It actually measures radiation that's been transmitted from GPS satellites and forward scattered off the sea surface. And the amount of radiation that's forward scattered turns out, not surprisingly, to depend on how rough the surface is. And so you can get a pretty good idea of the wind speed. Now, these are very early results for actually Hurricane Harvey. And you can see those strips that run across the picture there are passes of the satellite. And the colors are the wind speeds that have been measured. But this is very early results. They don't, haven't calibrated the winds much more than 35 meters per second, which is sort of marginal hurricane wind speed. And so the color coding stops at 35 meters per second. But that will be remedied when the calibration is finally done. So this is, is nice because GPS radiation is about 19 centimeters, which is too long to be appreciably backscattered by raindrops. So it can see through rain. The GPS satellites are up there anyway. So this is actually a very inexpensive receiver. And I have great hopes that we will do a better job measuring hurricanes. That's where we are on instrumental measurements. Now I want to go to the uh, geological proxies for hurricanes. This is a fascinating field, which was called paleotempestology. There are all kinds of different methods that are employed. But the most straightforward and easy to understand has to do with the propensity of hurricanes, their storm surges, to wash large amounts of sand into backwater or back beach lagoons and marshes. And one of uh, the uh, world expert practitioners of this is our own Jeff Donnelly down at Woods Hole, who I have worked with occasionally. And this diagram, if you just focus on the top picture there, shows what happens. You have the ocean over on the left, a barrier beach, and you might have a marsh behind that, uh, or a lagoon and or a lagoon. And there's constant organic deposition that goes on. Plants live and die, settle to the bottom. But when a storm comes along, it washes sand into these regions. And um, you can pile up some uh, very expensive equipment with graduate students and go out and measure these things. 
Um, this is a group at Woods Hole. You can see how expensive that equipment is, two canoes with a kind of a U-bar over it. This is the kind of science I really love, right? <laughs> right? You don't have to write a huge NASA grant to do this kind of thing. So they go out there with coring devices, and we'll go back a picture. They core down into the marsh or to the lagoon, pull up a core. It's rich with this organic material with sand layers in, interspersed. Well, you can radiocarbon date the mud and, and tell when the sand layers were put down and get interesting records of hurricanes. You can check them against historical records during the historical period. This uh, is an example of such a record. If you look at the top chart and read it from left to right, it's, uh, the time scale is up at the top. This goes back uh, almost 6,000 years. This is a core from Vieques in Puerto Rico, and I suspect that last night they got another big, big sample of uh, sand in, in to, their, to the lagoon there. But where you see spi upward spikes in this record corresponds to these sand layers. And uh, what's interesting about that is that there are periods, clearly if you look at this, where, which are relatively active, and periods marked by the gray bars which are relatively inactive. The middle graph shows an entirely different proxy from a different part of the world, which is a proxy for the incidence of El Nino, which is known to suppress Atlantic hurricanes, and sure enough, uh, there are periods when there are many El Nino events, the upward black spikes, and those uh, correspond to relative quiet in the Atlantic. So we're beginning to learn from paleotempestology something about the um, millennial to, uh, well, centennial to millennial timescale variability of hurricane activity. This is a, an attempt to summarize different proxies from different parts of the world. So the time scale here goes from 1550 to more or less the present. The red at the bottom is based upon a um, geochemical proxy for hurricanes, which is itself very interesting, from Belize. Uh, and then other proxies going up, up the chart to Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Florida, and Bermuda. And what you can see on this chart is sort of a, those bars show you relative levels of hurricane activity at those places. And what you see there is that at Belize, there is a lot of activity early on and progressively less as time goes on, whereas at Bermuda, it's just the opposite. And the trend sort of reverses in the middle there. So there's a sort of an indication of a northward shift in Atlantic hurricane activity. And I have high hopes that this kind of endeavor is going to tell us more about the relationship between hurricanes and climate. All right, so, so much for history and geology. What does physics have to tell us about the relationship between hurricanes and climate? Now, a hurricane is uh, actually a remarkable example of a natural heat engine, an engine that converts heat energy into, in this case, wind energy. And the fascinating thing about it is it comes very close to a, a perfect, ideal Carnot heat engine. Um, what you see on this diagram is a cross-section, a cartoon, obviously, through a hurricane whose central axis is on the left. And I've put sort of the eye wall cloud in gray. And if you were to so unwise as to go for a ride in a hot air balloon, uh, and starting at point A in the lower right there, you'd spiral in toward the eye wall. Assuming you survived, you got into the eye wall, you go rocketing up and then out at an altitude of 15, 16 kilometers. And over many, many weeks, uh, you would return back down to A. Uh, you can sort of make it a closed cycle, at least in models. Now, the uh, lurid colors on this diagram are a measure of the enthalpy content of the air, including its water vapor. All you really need to know about it is sort of a quasi-conserved variable, an entropy type variable. Um, that can only be changed by evaporation or heat flux from the sea surface. That's the main source. And the main sink is infrared radiation to space. And just moving the air around won't change this particular metric. So when you go from A to B, you notice that you're going from blue to orange. That entropy measure is increasing a lot. And that's reflecting the thing that powers the hurricane. It's fluxes of heat from the ocean, mostly latent heat. You evaporate water. You transfer heat out of the body of water and into the air, but also a little bit of sensible heat. 
Then when you go from B to C, you're going along a line of constant color. That's adiabatic. And then eventually, the heat you gain from the ocean is lost at very high altitudes by infrared radiation to space. And so uh, what you have, in effect, are the four legs of a perfect Carnot cycle. A to B is an isothermal expansion going from high to low pressure in the core of the hurricane. B to C is an adiabatic expansion. C to D is an approximately isothermal compression. And then D to E is an adiabatic compression. And it's actually remarkably efficient for a natural engine because the temperature at, at, the, at the warm source, the sea surface, is around 300 Kelvin. And the temperature up at the tropopause is around 200. And that gives you a Carnot efficiency for those of you who have had 560 or some course like that of about a third. So about a third of the energy that's going into a hurricane uh, is uh, converted into wind energy, which is dissipated frictionally. An average North Atlantic hurricane um, dissipates on the order of 3 trillion watts of energy at a rate of 3 trillion watts, um, which is an appreciable fraction of human global electrical consumption. Um, now, it turns out that from all of this, and I'm not going to explain this, we can derive a formula for the square of the maximum possible wind speed in a hurricane when it's, the whole thing is in balance and you're dissipating about as much mechanical energy as you're generating. And it depends on the surface temperature, um, the temperature T sub naught at the outflow level of the hurricane. And then the, um, the main driver is the thermodynamic disequilibrium that exists between the tropical ocean and atmosphere. Um, that's represented by the third term in parentheses there. And we can easily calculate these quantities from a sounding or from climate data to see what it's, what it's like. Now, the coefficients in front are exchange coefficients for enthalpy and momentum at the sea surface. We actually don't know what they are at high wind speed, but their ratio is probably of order one. Um, so we can calculate that. And if you look at the annual maximum value of today's climate, average value with potential intensity in meters per second, this is what it looks like. Uh, all the major hurricane areas are there. Um, peak wind speeds are of order of 70 or 80 meters per second, which is close to the peak sp speeds we observe in hurricanes. You'll notice that um, energetically, you could have a hurricane right at the equator. Mechanically, you can't. You cannot have a large-scale rotating vortex on the equator. Uh, that's just saying that the engine can't physically work in those conditions. If they, it can work, this gives an energy bound on how strong. We call that the potential intensity. Here is a map uh, just from a few days ago, or earlier this month, just before Hurricane Irma went through the uh, northern Caribbean of the potential intensity. This is made out from real time analyses of whether of the ocean and atmospheric state. Now, on the other hand, real hurricanes seldom achieve, but sometimes do achieve their potential. This shows a cumulative frequency distribution of observed hurricanes, where we take their lifetime peak wind speed and divide it by the potential intensity at the place and time it reached its peak. And then we just count events. So um, in this case, we've divided the events into two categories because the data seemed to demand it. One were storms that never made it past tropical storm strength, that's in blue, and then storms that did, that's in red. And you can see that they, for reasons we don't really understand, the cumulative distributions are straight lines. It means there's an equal probability within each of these two categories of storms um, reaching some fraction of their potential intensity across the whole range of intensities. And we don't see storms that exceed their potential intensity. So indeed, it does act as it should as an energy bound. Now, we've known for 30 years that if you start pumping a greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, you're going to force this thermodynamic limit to increase. That's basic physics. Uh, you can't get as much heat out of the ocean by infrared radiation to space directly. So you have to have more evaporation. If you have more evaporation, you have a greater evaporative potential. And that's really what it's all about. If we look at simple models and look at how potential intensity changes 
with carbon dioxide. This is what this graph shows. This is starting with today's value at the lower left and then successively doubling CO2. Its radiative effect is logarithmic. That's why we look at essentially the log of the CO2. And this shows the potential intensity in this particular calculation in meters per second. It goes up, but then it saturates. And that saturation is very well understood. If you get to make the lower tropical atmosphere too opaque to infrared radiation, further increases in CO2 will keep elevating the sea surface temperature. It keeps going up. But the thermodynamic limit on hurricanes is bounded. Okay. And we're, you know, after two doublings of CO2, I hope we never get there, but after two doublings, according to this calculation, you're not going to get much more increase. But if we look at climate data, this potential intensity clearly is going up. This shows from climate analyses the trend, the linear trend in potential intensity all around the world between 1980 and 2010. And um, it's in meters per second of wind speed per decade. So most of this chart is red. In most places, potential intensity is going up. The few places it's going down are places where it's already very small. Um, and in the rates appreciable, three meters per second per decade, that's quite a lot uh, of wind speed change. We can also calculate this potential intensity from climate models. And here is the same kind of map but showing a projected trend over the rest of this century from a particular climate model, the GFDL model, under a particular sort of pessimistic emission scenario where we don't do very much to control our emissions. And that also goes up with a pattern not unlike what we're already seeing in observations. So we would make these inferences from this basic theory, potential intensity increases with global warming, and therefore, we think the incidence of the very high category events that are up near that potential intensity limit today should increase. Um, for various reasons I haven't gone into but have to do with this approach to saturation, we think the increase would be faster in the subtropics than in the tropics. And we see that in both the projections and in the last 20 or 30 years. And then very simple physics, basically just the Clausius-Clapeyron equation tells us that as you warm the atmosphere, there's more water vapor in it, 7% more, 7% uh, increase in water vapor for about one degree centigrade increase in temperature. Therefore, hurricanes should rain more, all right? Um, okay, so that's just from basic theory. Can we go beyond that? Can we sort of use more sophisticated physics to estimate hurricane risk? So one thing you might ask is, why don't we just run a climate model and see what kind of hurricanes it produces? All right. That has been done. Why shouldn't we just use climate models to do that? But there's a huge problem with doing it, and it's, it's just a technical problem. It has to do with the limited speed of even today's computers. The models are way too coarse to simulate destructive hurricanes. They just are. And to illustrate that, what I'm showing you here is the frequency distribution of wind speed. Um, in nature, that's the black line. So it, we're going from 10 meters per second, which isn't very much, all the way up to 90, which is a lot. The black vertical line is the division between category two and category three on the Saffir Simpson scale. The black is observed. The red is modeled with a really state-of-the-art climate model with much higher resolution than you normally find. It simply does not simulate category three storms or higher. And the climate modelers are, of course, conscious of that. Um, this is a big problem. And in fact, we know from running very detailed simulations of hurricanes, your computational nodes have to be a, only one or two kilometers apart to really get intense hurricanes. So how do we deal with this? Well, what we do uh, in my group is to um, make use of a very high resolution specialized model. This is a coupled ocean atmosphere model. Um, and uh, embed that either in climate analysis data or in GCMs to create a, a climatology of tropical cyclones. Now, the model I'm not going to spend any time on, but its great virtue is that its radial computational coordinate isn't just 
the distance from the center of the storm, as all other models are, basically. It's actually a physical quantity, the absolute angular momentum about the rotation axis of the storm. That becomes the independent variable. I've defined the angular momentum at the top left there. V is the swirling velocity. Omega is the rotation of the Earth. There's a contribution to that. That's a conserved quantity in an axisymmetric hurricane. You can only uh, change that by a torque with the surface, basically, or by eddies. And um, by using that as the independent spatial variable, uh, you, you solve a lot of problems. And here is just the ordinary radius versus height distribution of angular momentum in a fairly ordinary hurricane. So the rotation axis is at the left. And each of those color lines is a different angular momentum surface spaced equally in angular momentum. And you can see that they automatically become very concentrated there over on the left there. That's the eye wall. So you automatically get high resolution where you need it. It's a very, very fast model. Uh, you can run it on your laptop for a, a whole storm in just a few seconds, literally. And we have been running it since about 2001. Uh, to do real-time intensity forecasting of real hurricanes. And I can direct you to a website where you can see those forecasts for every storm on the planet. How do we do? Well, this is the intensity error uh, produced by this model uh, over the period 2009 to 2015 as a function of how far out you're forecasting the storm. So 12 hours all the way out to 120. The black line is the official National Hurricane Center intensity forecast errors. Uh, nobody can beat them because the same people who forecast the storms are also verifying their intensity. There's no double blind in my profession, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. The red line is a state-of-the-art model that has all the physics we know about, and it's run at DFDL. You have to call the power company before you can run that one. And the blue is the... Um, I'm sorry, the blue is the GFDL model, I got confused, and the red is this very simple model I just described. So we don't do quite as well in the mid-range, 36 to 72 hours, but not too bad for a model that takes a few seconds to run. So we ask ourselves, can we use this model to help assess hurricane risk in this climate and future climates? And how do we do that? In the first case, we begin by taking a climate data set, a global coarse-grained climate data set, or perhaps a climate model, and we seed it randomly with proto-hurricanes. It's like going down to the garden shop, buying a packet of hurricane seeds and just spreading it all over the model. It's literally random in space and time. We find out where those seeds are going to go, how they're going to move, by making use of the simple fact that hurricanes more or less move. Uh, with some weighted vertical average flow in which they're embedded, like a rotating cork in a stream. But there is another component of motion that has to do with the Earth's curvature and rotation, something called the beta effect, that has to be accounted for as well. But the key step is to run this intensity model I just described along each track. And that predicts that a very large fraction of the seeds you put down, say 98%, just die right away. Um, which is kind of my success rate as an amateur gardener, by the way. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. They just die. And so the idea is you're kind of using an analogy to biological natural selection. The seeds that are put down in a bad environment don't grow. The ones that are put down in a good environment do. But we can easily generate 100,000 survivors, okay, uh, without much uh, CPU being expended to do that. All right. So here is an example of a thousand such tracks generated by downscaling a climate analysis, valid at the end of the 20th century, color-coded according to intensity. Those of you who have seen hurricane maps can sort of see whether this is, uh, that this has a fairly realistic distribution of storms around the world. Uh, but the beauty is that if we compare their intensity distributions, this is just showing the number of events um, on the y-axis, whose intensity exceeds the value on the x-axis. Um, the red is from these uh, synthetic tracks, and the blue is from observed historical tracks. We capture the whole probability distribution of wind speeds, whereas, it, as you saw before, 
the uh, GCMs only capture the, about the left half of that diagram, and they fall off to zero. Um, we uh, can, if we simulate the end of the 20th century, compare predictions of the interannual variability of Atlantic storms to nature. And so this chart, which runs from 1980 to, I think, 2012 or something like that, shows in blue something called the hurricane power dissipation. It's the rate at which hurricanes dissipate energy in the Atlantic from historical observations. And the red is from this random seeding. And it captures much more variance than I thought it would uh, have any right to expect. Um, and that is because the incidence of hurricanes in a climate system is largely controlled by the large scale climate. And there's only some random component in the number of hurricanes you have. Now, having done this, we can now run this back in time using a climate analysis, a remarkable one generated by NOAA that goes all the way back to 1850. And it's basically a model, a weather forecasting type model, but it's driven by observed sea surface temperatures. And we have observed ocean temperatures pretty well over that period. Observed sea level pressure and uh, sea ice content up in the Arctic. And that's it. It doesn't need atmospheric observations. And this shows the number of major hurricanes that this downscaling method predicts uh, should have happened in the Atlantic going back to that time. And the green is just a smooth version. The red is literally every year. And what that shows is kind of a gradual upward trend that began around 1900, but was interrupted rather spectacularly beginning in the 1960s and continuing into the 1990s in what's become known as the Great North Atlantic Hurricane Drought. This is a, a well-documented actual phenomenon. And it was during this hurricane drought that so much construction and development occurred along the US East and Gulf Coast. Now, this is a story for another day. I happen to think and have some evidence that that was a man-made drought. And it was made by uh, sulfate aerosol pollution. And what I'm showing you here is a flipped upside down and scaled curve of European sulfur emissions. There are good records of those. Why Europe? The summer airflow takes uh, sulfur over Europe down over the Mediterranean and the Sahara and then out to sea over the tropical Atlantic. And uh, you can see there's a correspondence. But the case for this uh, rests on much more than what you see in this diagram. That's a, another story. I think we caused the hurricane drought. All right, once we have these synthetic events, we can couple them to hydrodynamic storm surge models. And here you're seeing two grids that we use to do an analysis of the, of the risk of storm surge in New York City. And this is a paper we published back in 2010. Uh, my postdoc, Ning Lin, and I did this work. There's a, there's a, a tide gauge since 1923 at the battery at the lower end of Manhattan. So that's where we looked at surges. And we published this diagram from running thousands and thousands of synthetic hurricanes over this, uh, through this surge model. What this shows is a measure of the probability of the surge versus its magnitude. So the magnitude of the surge is on the left axis in meters. And the return period, which is just the inverse annual probability, is on the right axis. So 5 times 10 to the second, 500, is a storm whose annual probability is 1 in 500. We sometimes call that the 500-year event, although people then start to misinterpret that as something cyclic. Of course, it isn't. It's just a probability. Now, if we, this was before Sandy. We published this before Sandy. Sandy happened. Um, 2.8 meter surge relative to the sea level at the time, we would have guessed that in the climate of the late 20th century, that would have been a 1 in 600 or 700 year event. Others have come to similar conclusions. We saw a very rare event with Hurricane Sandy. Now what I want to do to get back to the title of this talk is to apply this method in retrospect to the probabilities of some of the hurricanes we've just had. And I'm going to start with Harvey, Hurricane Harvey in Texas. So what do we do here? We're going to try to do a risk assessment for Houston Metro and also for the whole state of Texas. And we're going to do that 
by first running 100 events for each year from 1980 to 2016. So that's 3,700 hurricanes in total, passing within 300 kilometers of Houston. Downscaled from three different analyses of the climate over that period. So three climate reanalyses. We're also separately going to run 100 events each year from 1979 to 2015, almost the same set of years. But these are storms that pass anywhere over the Texas coastline, uh, not just around Houston. Uh, downscaled from a single reanalysis. And we're going to, in both cases, actually calculate from the same model the rainfall for each event uh, at each, in the second case at each of 78 points around coastal Texas, but excluding the Gulf of Mexico. And finally, we're going to run 100 events each year for two periods of time, 1981 to 2000 and 2081 to 2100, passing within 300 kilometers of Houston, uh, and use six climate models to do this. Okay, so now in the last case, we're looking forward. So here's an example of the storm total rainfall from a really extreme event in this very large number of storms we downscaled from actual climate reanalyses. This is a Harvey-like event in that it came in from the Gulf kind of stalled over coastal Texas and then went back out to sea again along that black line. Uh, can you see where you are on the map? Uh, the Western Gulf and Texas, and Northern Mexico. And the uh, lurid colors are the contours of the storm accumulated rainfall, total rainfall produced over the course of the event with largest values up to a meter, okay? Three feet of rain or so. So you can see that occurred in this arc corresponding sort of to the eye wall of the storm. So that's one of a set of 3,700 events for that particular reanalysis, and we did that for two others. And by that means, we could estimate the probability of storm accumulated rainfall at Houston. So this is the metro Houston area. So it's a probability of rain in that specific place, not all of Texas, from the three climate reanalyses. And the shading on this diagram is the scatter among the three, is a measure of the scatter among the three climate models. And the dots are the mean. And the return period, again, the inverse annual probability is this time on the y-axis, it's a logarithmic axis. And the magnitude of the rain is on the x-axis. The vertical line is sort of Harvey's uh, sort of aerially averaged rainfall depth when all is said and done according to the state climatologists of the state of Texas, who used to be a student here, by the way. So we would estimate that Harvey, in the climate of around 1990, would have been for Houston about a 1 in 2,000 year event. Now, on the other hand, if we run the whole state of Texas, we're asking a different question. What's the probability of accumulated rain anywhere in the state of Texas of Harvey's magnitude? Same kind of chart, but now this is for the, any point in Texas, among 78 points we used to do this analysis, that would have been a little bit more than 100 years. So for Texas, Harvey, had it occurred at the end of the 20th century, would have been about an annual probability of 1%, that magnitude. Now this is the interesting thing. This is now looking forward. So this is running the six climate models. And again, this is just for Houston, not for Texas. We're back to Houston again. Uh, the blue dots show the return period for the end of the 20th century, and the red dots show the return periods for the end of the 21st century. Again, the shading shows you the scatter among the models. And um, there again, consistent with the reanalysis in the 20th century, we would estimate the probability of a Harvey-like rain the end of the 20th century to be about one in 2,000 years. But at the end of the 21st century, it's going to be more like one in 100 years, with remarkably little scatter among the climate models, which frankly surprised me. So climate change, if it's unimpeded, uh, will greatly increase the probability of extreme events. We see that whenever you shift a normal distribution, you see big changes in the tails, and this is no exception. Now, I was going to talk to you about how why the rainfall is increasing so much, but I'm going to skip that because I don't want to not leave time for questions and talk about Irma, 
uh, which was, broke all kinds of records. Harvey did too, by the way. It produced more rain than any hurricane ever measured in the United States over a long period of time. Irma was, uh, maintained itself at Category 5 status for longer than any hurricane ever measured on the planet. Um, and in this case, we're going to again, uh, just looking at the six climate models, run 100 events during the same two periods of time. And I see that I goofed. I forgot to change this. This is not 300 kilometers of Houston. It's 300 kilometers of the island of Barbuda in the Caribbean. Sorry about that. And um, now we see a lot more scatter among the models. Uh, but the same qualitative measure, Irma had 185 mile per hour peak winds. It's about 160 nautical miles per hour. Uh, the probability of an event like that at the end of the 20th century would have been about 1 in 800, a very, very improbable event. At the end of this century, 1 in 80 years, just merely rare, OK? Uh, and so it was a rare event, no matter how you cut and slice it. But climate change will make it less so. Now let me wrap up with the question of where we're all seated right now, which is MIT. And I'm going to talk about an ongoing work. We're actually not that far along in it. So this is hot off the press, but it's really not ready for the press, uh, of MIT's hurricane flood risk. And it's work I've been doing with Cy Ravella and uh, Ken Strizpeck uh, from Civil Engineering and the MIT Resilience Committee. So the, the uh, physical plant has been involved in this work, uh, campus police and so forth. We're really tying together a very broad patch of the MIT community. And so the first thing we did is to look at rain. And we looked at the probability of various kinds of rainfall in Cambridge and Boston. Uh, this is the same kind of chart we've been seeing before from the same models, basically. And, um, but much smaller amounts than you see down in the tropics. But here again, the message is, as you go forward in time, a 1,000-year event may become a 10-year event and that sort of thing by the end of the century. So big changes in hurricane rain. Everybody in my profession who studied this problem comes to the same conclusion. Hurricane rainfall has got to go up on average. And we see that everywhere we look. The Charles River Dam, which holds back the Charles River, is currently at high tide, something like three feet. I can't remember the exact number, over high water. Not mean water, but high water. And so we're concerned about the combination of a surge at the Charles River Dam, which prevents water from getting out, and then a pulse of fresh water coming down from heavy rain. So let's look at the surge risk. This is the surge risk at the Charles River Dam today in blue, more or less today, uh, forward in red. And you can see an appreciable change in the risk, again, a reduction in the probability owing to the fact that storms that make it up here will be stronger. But in this chart, we haven't factored in the fact that sea level will undoubtedly be higher. And if we put in a meter of sea level rise at the end of the century, then we get events. Uh, basically, you're overtopping the Charles River Dam on a nice sunny day at high tide. Okay. So the next step is to, to put this all together. And what Ken does is very, very detailed hydrological modeling of water flowing through storm drains and around the campus over buildings, spectacular films of water coming into classrooms and so forth. They're <laughs> kind of spooky, actually. And here is a, a projection of the 1 in 100 year of a flood, if you will, uh, by the year 2070. And this is just showing what parts of, I don't know if you recognize the MIT campus map there, there's the Charles River at the bottom. This is sort of flood water depth. Uh, or places that will be flooded by the one in a hundred year event in 2070. That's without rain. We haven't put the rain in yet. Okay, this is just the surge. So it's ongoing work. But, you know, I think this is something we need to pay attention to. There's a lot of value underground, the, the new nano building at MIT. All right. Let me wrap up here just very quickly. I argue that the observational record is too short and noisy and too low quality to make really good estimates of climate signals. Of course, we can see things, short periods, things like ENSO, El Nino events. The satellite data, for what it's worth, do show a migration of peak intensity toward high latitudes. 
And there is, I didn't show you this, some indication of a greater fraction of intense hurricanes. Recovery of hurricane proxies from the geological record is beginning to show some climate signals. I think that's a very promising avenue. If there are students here wondering what they can do, come and see me or Jeff Donnelly will sign you up for this. Potential intensity theory demonstrates that the thermodynamic limit on hurricane intensity rises with temperature. We've known that for 30 years. Observations now show that this limit is, in fact, going up, this thermodynamic limit. We can use this and other physics to develop a way of estimating hurricane risk that's based on physics. I'm very fond of this idea. Your insurance premiums, if you pay them, are based purely on the statistics of historical events. In other words, we've left the whole thing up to statisticians. I have nothing against statisticians. But we can do better than that. And past risk, even if we knew what it was, is not going to be a very good guide to future risk because the underlying climate is changing. So we really need to bring physics into this problem. Rain of Harvey's magnitude somewhere in the state of Texas was a 1% annual probability in 1990. It's projected to be an 18% annual probability by 2090. If we just linearly interpolate the frequencies, we would see that it would be about 6% today. That is, according to this kind of analysis, climate change has already changed the underlying probability of a Harvey-type rain event by a factor of six. Uh, Irma's peak winds within 300 kilometers of Barbuda, um, estimated to have an annual probability of 0.13% in 1990, increasing to 1.3% in 2090. And finally, uh, I'll leave you with this thought, because I think it's interesting and needs some work. MIT's risk for floods is not negligible even today, and it uh, is probably going to increase during the century unless we finally uh, get our act together and do something about emissions of greenhouse gases. Thank you very much. Okay, so Terry is open for questions. So there's a microphone coming around just here. The guy with the coat of the So thank you, as, as, as usual. Um, can you speak to what you said you were going to skip over, but then talk to mention toward the end of your talk, and that is why the increase in rainfall? Well, the short answer, and it's not very precise, is the two biggest factors are just increased water vapor in the atmosphere. That's not a surprise. But also the increased duration of rain events. These storms, some of them, will be moving slower. That was the big factor in Harvey, by the way, which is moving very slowly. This technique predicts that these high-end events will be moving more slowly, and that also contributes to it. Any other questions? There's one in the front row there. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you about what type of data you have, Jasper. You describe a little more data, because I'm a statistician, and I'm interested in what types of data you have. So you're, let me just be certain what you're just, asking. I mean, yeah. have you just a map of the data in each point of world surface? You're talking about the hurricane data? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, there's been very extensive work done on the hurricane data that continues to this day. Um, in round numbers, there are about 90 events on the planet every year. Um, the ones that are measured in the Atlantic number three or four per year, on the other hand. So it's not a very rich data set. It's not terribly robust for doing statistics. Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, you've talked a lot about the probabilities of individual storms. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of collection of anomalous storms that we seem to be having this year? Uh, three storms in a row that each set their own kind of records. As you mentioned, Harvey for total rainfall, Irma for the duration of its uh, peak intensity, and now Maria uh, apparently set a record for the 
rap rapidity of increasing from category one to in category five. Each of those individually is, is unlikely, but can you say something about the Collective. probabilities yeah. of all of those things happening in one year? You know, that's a good question. We haven't really looked at questions like that. We tend to, to look at the easier questions of what happens. And, you know, if you, this, again, you're dealing with the poor quality of the historical database. It's always a lurking issue. For what it's worth, I mean, we do see trends, upward trends, in the fraction of storms that are high wind speed categories. But they're not necessarily passing statistical muster. They don't pass at the sort of 95% confidence level. But I keep trying to take my colleagues and say, now, wait a minute. It's not just a problem in signal detection. If that's what it were, that would be the level we would apply. It's a problem of risk. And to be conservative, little c conservative, in risk assessment is almost the opposite of being conservative in signal detection, right? If theory and models tell you should be more rain, the data is consistent with that, but doesn't show it at a statistical level, you're going to say, OK, I'm not going to bet on there being more rain if I'm going to build a reservoir or something. No, nobody would do that. So we have to be very careful to separate the question of statistically significant trends uh, from the question of what's, what's the actual risk assessment with all of its attendant uncertainty. Two very different questions. Um, does a, hur a large hurricane extract enough energy from the ocean to make it less likely that another hurricane will follow in its track? Because we seem to, we seem to be seeing the opposite of that. <laughs> yes. Well. Um, there's an awful lot of thermal heat stored in the upper ocean. And so if you take all the heat that you're pumping into the atmosphere and distribute it over the first 50 meters or so of the ocean, it cools by a few tenths of a degree. It isn't very much. But, but there's a much more important factor, which is that hurricanes mechanically stir up, turbulently stir up cold water from beneath the warmest water at the surface of the ocean. And they produce spectacular cold wakes that you can see on satellites, which are fascinating in their own right. They're biological responses to those cold wakes and thermal responses. Uh, but that feedback is very important, which is one reason why the intensity model I was talking about is coupled to the ocean. It has to be, because this upwelling actually uh, not only affects subsequent storms that pass over the cold wake, but the storm that's causing it in the first place is affected. It's a strong negative feedback. It's one of the things that limits our ability to predict intensity. We're really bad at forecasting individual storm intensity. I mean, we haven't gotten any better in 30 years. That's pretty bad. One of the factors is that in practice, we don't observe the upper ocean well enough to know in real time what the thermal structure is below the surface uh, with enough accuracy to be able to predict how much cooling there will be. That's getting better. Right now, we, we're data starved in that sense. Kerry, you've concentrated on hurricanes. Uh, how about typhoons? It strikes me that I'm guessing that the, um, the historical record of typhoon landfalls is probably much greater, goes back farther and with more accuracy than hurricanes. So uh, could you comment on how the analysis of typhoons might differ in any respect from that of hurricanes that you've talked about? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, when I was talking about, of course, hurricane typhoon, physically the same phenomena, just regional names. That's, you know that. That's for the benefit of. Um, I had a colleague, one of the same people who founded the field of paleotempestology, Kambyu Liu, who works out of Louisiana State University, but who's Chinese. And he went back to China and spent a few years combing the historical records from coastal cities and ended up writing a paper about the long-term variability of typhoons uh, from those records. Now, the problem, of course, is the records are helter-skelter, incomplete. He wasn't able to really do, you know, I think it would take decades to really do this correctly. And you begin to see some signals, but uh, nothing that really stands out in terms of climate change.
Hi there, Kerry. Um, so it was really interesting seeing the new data from the Cygnus satellite. And I was just hoping maybe you could comment briefly on how you think GO16 in the future GOES R generation is going to help uh, with hurricane observations. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part. Uh, GO16 and yeah. the GOES R generation in general, how you think those are going to help with hurricane observations. OK. so. Um, the traditional observations that are made by geostationary satellites uh, are just visible radiation photographs, uh, if you will, and um, infrared, various infrared bands, and uh, many, many different channels. And these modern satellites are looking more precisely at very many different bands of emission and uh, much higher spatial resolution. And that does help with something called the Dvorak technique where you use a combination of those in a kind of empirical, semi-empirical method to make an intensity estimate. So we all expect them to get better, but nobody expects them to be as accurate as what you can measure in situ. And so uh, I personally think that we should be flying UAVs, uh, and I'm working on that with some other people here at MIT, to monitor tropical cyclones all around the world to supplement those satellites. Um, so thanks to people like you and great work that you're doing, we're understanding more and more better and better what's going on with the, 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 these phenomena. I think there's a question lurking, which is, um, so what's your sense of the level of resources that we're as a society devoting to this research? And, and firstly, and then secondly, how are we doing in terms of addressing it, the risks, the growing damage and danger that we're increasingly better understanding? Well, I'm going to just, if you don't mind, tackle the second part of your question and not go into the first because it, it might go on too long. Um, we have a, a problem in this whole business of risk assessment. I've tried to persuade you that we're kind of in the Stone Ages collectively, relying on bad historical statistics to represent current risk, and telling you that I believe strongly that the future is to bring science, real science, not just math, but real physical science into the problem of risk assessment. Maybe not just for this problem, but especially for this problem. We're impeded by doing that by, frankly, by academic stovepiping. So, you know, uh, would I put a graduate student on to risk assessment? Probably not, not for the sake of their careers, because they're going to be told, well, this is applied science. This is not, you know, this is not fundamental research. And in some sense, that's a correct criticism. And the engineers say, you know, this is too physical for us, and so it gets lost, all right? There's no, um, there's no really good way, I'm sure we could figure out how to do it, by the way, here at MIT, because there are ways that we can cross disciplines. But globally, uh, it's very hard to catalyze this field and get a lot more people interested in, in physical, physics-based risk assessment. Thank you. I mean, I really appreciate your answer. Um, but I'm also asking, how are we doing as a society to address yeah. mitigation? I mean to address the crisis of global warming? Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> so any further questions? Oh, yeah, there's one right behind you. Uh, thanks, Kerry. Great talk. Could you talk a bit about what controls the shape of the tracks in the Atlantic, and also if you expect any trends there? Well, yes, that's, a, that's also a very good question. The uh, hurricanes pretty much move with a large-scale flow in which they're embedded, sort of a, a suitably defined vertically averaged large-scale flow plus a correction for the Earth's rotation. It's, it's not difficult physics. But you're correct to address that when we look at climate change, and I really didn't talk about this here, but it was implicit in some of what I showed you. It's, it's not just about how does the intensity of the storms change, how do their frequency change, but how do their tracks change, including where they form and how they move. And they do change. And you see a lot of inconsistency 
when you go from one climate model to the next and how that changes forecasted. So there's also a lot of uncertainty in that. But when I showed you, for example, those probability maps for Barbuda and for Houston, that was implicit in that. I mean, we ran events over the whole Atlantic and only looked at those that passed within a certain distance of these places. And so the, any change in the tracks would affect that as well. So it was implicit in there, but one could also look explicitly on how those tracks changed. I just didn't show you that. So I'm just wondering, what is the latest with the science of, um, and I know this is, depends on ocean basin, but maybe just in the Atlantic, uh, the impact of climate change on the vertical wind shear and also on the outflow temperature at the top of the troposphere? So um, the wind shear is kind of all over the place, but um, how can I make this not a very technical answer? If you look at the spectrum of wind in the atmosphere, it tends to be uh, weighted toward fairly high frequencies compared to temperature, right? So you see a lot of variability on daily or weekly time scales. And if you get further and further out on that frequency curve to lower and lower frequencies, it, the amplitude drops off, all right? So when you look at climate time, scale, time scales, average wind shear might vary by, in the tropics, where we're talking about by a meter per second or two one sign or another, it's scattered among the models. Whereas with the potential intensity or any thermodynamic quantity, it's, it's red, okay? It tends to favor the low frequencies. So the nut in a nutshell, the wind shear is terribly important, no question about it. But it's much more important for day-to-day, week-to-week, year-to-year even variability. And as you start getting out to centennial, you don't see as much variability in it. Okay, so I see no further questions, so let's thank Karen for some very